Hey, welcome to Echo Church Online. My name is Tim. I'm the Church Online Pastor here, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you for what we're doing here at Echo during the season. Uh, glad that you're tuning in. If you're new to Echo Church, and even if you're online, we just want to welcome you. We're so thrilled that you're here. Uh, make sure you let us know. Leave a comment in the chat. We have a team that's there that can chat with you, connect, answer any questions you might have, can even pray with you. Uh, leave a call. Just let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to see you and uh, learn a little bit more about you. Uh, today, we are continuing the series we've been in called Blessable. We've been talking about the story of Haggai. Uh, that's in the Old Testament, one of the shortest books in the Bible. And we're talking about the kind of life that God longs to bless. You're going to get to hear some great stories from some people here at Echo who've really truly learned what it means to live that kind of life that God blesses to be generous in every way possible. So I can't wait for you all to hear from them in just a few moments. The other thing I want to point your attention to is if you open your device, open a tab to echo.church forward slash connect. That's what we call our digital program. On there, we put all the most helpful links that go along with our time together today, like message notes, place for you to get resources, checking in with us, any prayer requests you might have. All those things are available there in your digital program. So please take advantage of it and make the most during our service. Now we're going to begin our time together with worship. We're going to sing these songs to focus our heart's attention towards God. So let's join in with our broadcast campus as we sing and worship God together. Good morning. Welcome to Echo Church. Happy Sunday. We're so glad that you're here today. Please stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together and prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
you've heard of all the stories Of how you heal the deaf and blind and You did miracles and wonders Would you repeat them in our time? Lord, we thank you for your presence You promised not to leave. Yeah, come and clothe us. Come and clothe us with your power. Come and set the captives free. Yeah, we sing it out now. Hear your people crying out. Holy Spirit, would you come? Yeah, we make this our prayer.
just getting started. Don't worry. Uh, what a great way to open our time together today. Uh, but today is also a joyous occasion across all of our campuses because we are celebrating baptisms, which is life transformation. People who have made that decision to say, Jesus, I have aligned my life with you. I have made you my Lord and Savior. And as their public act of declaration, they go into the water and they come up a new creation in Christ. This morning, we got to witness two beautiful baptisms right here at North San Jose. And at this service, there is no one scheduled. But one of the things that we know is that sometimes God wants to break our schedules and do something new in our hearts. And as I was preparing for this moment, I was reminded of the moment when Jesus went forward for his baptism. He told John, he said, we must do it this way. And the reason he said that is so others would recognize what this represents. And as he went under the water and came up, it says that the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And they heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my son who I love. In him I am well pleased. And maybe that's just what you needed to hear because in Jesus' life, he hadn't done anything. He hadn't started his ministry. All he had done is said, Jesus, I'm aligning with you. Or God, I'm aligning with you. And so if you're here today and you've made that decision to follow Jesus and you've been kind of waiting to get baptized until you've earned it, we just want to set you free now to feel the opportunity to get in the pool just as you are because he looks at you and he says, I am pleased with you. I love you, my son or my daughter. And so if that's you and you didn't come prepared, we have a change of clothes for you in the back. You can slip out right now and make your way to uh, our baptism team with the blue wand in the back there. And they'll help you get changed and usher in. And as they do that and we just sit here and reflect together as a campus, we're going to sing a song called House of Miracles where we have the opportunity to reflect on the miracles that God has done in our campus and through our church over the last year and in our own lives. And so as we prepare for that, would you pray with me? Father, we just honor you right now. We recognize that you have been doing amazing work through your son Jesus right here in our community. And we just surrender this moment to you, asking for your will to be done and that we can usher whoever might need to get baptized into that experience. And we'll celebrate with our other campuses and what happened this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
celebrate today. Amazing, amazing to see so many people respond in baptism. Hey, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to Echo. Would you take a second and say hello to the people around you as you find your seat? Well, happy St. Patrick's Day 10 a.m. service. 
I hope you all are doing well. This is your opportunity to look and see if somebody's wearing green near you. If they're not, pinch them. No, please don't do that. Okay, we don't do that here at Echo. Uh, warm welcome to those of you joining online, especially Carla, Cora, and Penny. How are you guys? Uh, in case we haven't met, my name is Steven. I am the campus pastor here at our North San Jose location, and I am thrilled that you made it out to church. Welcome. Uh, we are currently in a series called Blessable, and we're on week three. And there's a lot of information, a lot of opportunities to respond, but we wanted to make sure that you had all of those helpful helpful links and tools right at your fingertips. So our team has designed and updated our digital program with all of you in mind. So if you would, go ahead and grab your smartphone device. You can scan the QR code on the screen on the back of your chairs, or you can head directly to echo.church slash connect. Once you get there, you'll see all of those helpful links. If this is your very first time at Echo, we are so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, and we want to draw your attention on that digital program to the check-in button. At the end of our time together, you'll have an opportunity to check in and indicate that you are here for the very first time. When you do that, it lets us know, and then we want to send you a digital gift card as just a way of saying thank you for being here with us today. But beyond that, we love the opportunity to say hello in person. So as you head out these lobby doors to my left, your right, you'll notice there's a big red wall. We call that the hub. If you swing by there and let us know it's your first time, we have a physical gift that we'd like to place in your hands before you head out for the day. Now, we are getting really close to Easter in just a couple of weeks here at Echo, and there are a lot of exciting things coming up. And we know that Easter is one of those times where we have hundreds of new individuals and families walk through the doors and hear the life-giving message of hope in Jesus Christ. And so we want to do the best that we can to create that environment and have them come, but that means we need your help in inviting those individuals. And so we've been handing out those invitation cards the last couple of weeks, but we understand sometimes we want to use the digital format because of the world that we live in, or we want to put a post out on social media. So our marketing team has put together all of the different sizes to make your grid look good, to get your cover photo, all the stuff that you need with all of that information for Easter. And right there in your digital program, you can download those links or you can scan the QR code right here to have all of the access to send to friends, to coworkers, to post to your social media accounts as a way to invite people. We like to say, you never know what one invitation or one post could do for somebody's entire eternity. And so would you join us in doing that? Uh, at the bottom of the digital program, you'll notice there's a button that says view the message notes. One of the greatest tools to be able to follow along as we dive in to the message. And so I want you to grab those message notes and get your heart ready as we get to hear from our lead pastor, Felipe Santos. And would you join me in giving him a warm echo welcome right after this short video. What's up, Echo? Man, it's so good to be together with everybody. Welcome, Sunnyville, Fremont, San Jose, everybody online with us as well. Before we get into our topic, I want to just remind you, Easter is two weeks away, which means this is the time. Invite your friends, invite your coworkers, your neighbors, everybody that you've been bugging all year long to come to church and they haven't said yes, they'll say yes this week. So come, go ahead and invite them. It's going to be a really awesome experience. We've designed every part of the Easter experience thinking of all of your friends uh, that are going to be a part of, of this. So make sure to leverage this time, this season for that end. Also, I want you to know that right after Easter, we're going to launch perhaps the most important teaching series we've ever done in the history of our church. I know that's a lot to say, but I really believe it is so. It's called uh, Wonderfully Made, and we're, we're uh, co collectively teaching this with multiple churches here in the Bay Area. And it's a series all about the body, sexuality, gender, all the non-controversial parts of our 
conversations these days. Um, but we're going to look at how God designed us to be beautiful, how He designed us wonderfully made, and what that looks like to live out of that kind of identity. And I can't wait to get it started. I want to give you a heads up so you invite your friends. The whole series is designed as a bridge builder, not uh, a series to, ma- to make walls between us and people, but to really explore what the Scriptures have to say about our wonderful design. So just giving you a heads up on that. To get us started today, I want to share with you a story, something that happened a couple years ago with me. Um, I, got, I was on my email box about two years ago, and I had an email that came in that said something like this. We are a group of hackers, and we have hacked into your computer, and in fact, your camera, and we have recorded you looking at pornography. And unless you send us a sum of money to this PayPal account... We are going to send this video to your whole family and to your workplace. And when I got that, I thought, I don't know if I still have a PayPal account. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) Wow, so many nervous people right now. (laughs) I actually thought, oh my gosh, these people are brilliant. They probably made millions of dollars with this hack because there are so many people that would say, oh, no, do not do that. In fact, I heard of a few already, uh, even this weekend, that fell into this because of the fear of exposure. The other thing that came to my mind is, well, maybe if they were able to hack into my computer 25 years ago, they might have something on me. But I thought it's actually very refreshing to know I know this is a hack because I haven't looked at porn in 25 years. Now, before you start to think that maybe he's sharing this to be all righteous and so forth, I want you to know that I also had another thought, which was if they had sent me an email saying, we have hacked into your security cameras of your house, and we have video of you angrily screaming at your kids in the backyard, I would have said, show me the bank account. Because that's absolutely true. In fact, I installed sound panels in my house so my neighbors don't hear hear my angry screams. I didn't do that. But everybody's got something that they, they think, well, if somebody knew this, if they only knew this, I I would just pay any sum of money to not expose me. Have you wondered what it would be like to live in such a way that your whole life has nothing to hide? There is no guilt, no shame, no email that can come your way that says, we caught you. We know what you did last summer. We know what you did last week. We know what you did in the dark, and we're about to expose it. What if we didn't have to fear that kind of email? I want to talk to you about character. See, character is who we are when nobody is looking. Character is how we respond to hard things that happen in our life. It's really easy to display a certain kind of person when everything's going easy and when everyone just sees you in the superficial. But what about the stuff that we want to hide and not reveal to anybody else. See, we're studying the book of Haggai together, and it's a little mini book in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and it's right before the book of Matthew, if you're trying to look for it in your Bible there. And this book is only two little chapters, but it speaks of so much of the modern-day ambition and some of the blind spots that we have in our day and culture. So we're going to journey back. We're in week number three, talking about the blessable kind of life. To give you a little bit of context, uh, this is during the 500 B.C., so 2500 years ago, and what had happened is the Jewish people in Israel had their cities and their temple destroyed, and they were captive by the Babylonians, which is now Iraq. For 70 years, they were basically enslaved by those people until God set them free and sent 50,000 of them back to their land, and they had one mission, and the mission was this. I want you to go back and rebuild the temple and your lives around that temple. So these 50,000 people said, yes, we're set free. They went back to Israel. This is recorded as the Babylonian captivity period, if you study history. And when they went back, they were ambitious. They're like, yes, we're going to rebuild the temple. And the temple 
was not just about a physical structure. God does not live in temples built by human hands. It represented his desire to be with the people. And their mission to build the temple represented our calling as humans that know God to take God to the people and people to God. So when God sent them back to rebuild this temple, it was saying, I want you to put me first. I want you to build a structure that represents my desire to be in with every person in, in humanity. And so they started with that ambition. They started to build the temple. Two years, they built the whole foundation of the temple until things got really difficult. People started to throw thrones at them or throw stones at them. People started to persecute them. The government started to tax them. They were just oppressed on every, in every corner. And they made this decision. It's like, you know what? It's a little hard right now to focus on God. We're just going to focus on ourselves now. So for 16 years, they paused the building of God's work on the earth, and they just built their own homes, and then God sends Haggai to basically open their eyes to what was happening. And Haggai comes with a statement that he keeps repeating in this little book over and over again, and the statement is this, give careful thought to your ways. Other translations say, stop and think and consider what you're getting. Modern way of saying it is, how is this working for you? How is it working, your decisions, to prioritize yourself above God? Because then he goes on to say, you've planted a lot of stuff, but you harvest very little. And you eat, but you're still hungry, and you drink, and you're still thirsty. And in fact, even when you earn wages, it says it's like you're putting them in pockets filled with holes. And is this really the life you wanted. In other words, when you and I lay down to sleep at night, after accomplishing all we accomplish and earning the stuff and building our lives, do we feel the peace of God over us? When we wake up in the morning, is there joy that rises inside of us? Is there a, an expression of the grace of God? We call this the blessing of God over our lives or does it just feel like a bunch of work with endless stuff, but just an empty harvest, a result that leaves you longing for more? See, we've defined the blessing of God as the favor and the life-producing ability that God extends to those that align their lives with his will. So we've looked at several things so far. For example, the week one was blessable priorities. We learned this, that Haggai said, hey, unless you put God as first, there's no blessing in the rest. God must be first. And as Haggai called the people to put God first in the area of resources, we made a challenge here to Echo as well. And we challenged you to what we do call the 90-day tithe challenge. We do it every year at Echo. And it's a challenge for you to obey the words of God. And when he says, return 10% of your income back to the work of God on earth through the church. And over 200 families here at Echo re uh, committed to the tithe challenge for 90 days. Can we celebrate that? It matters. See, I really believe that when you put God first and you say, God, I'm going to give you this 10%, you can accomplish more with 90% in God's blessing than 100% on your own. And every time we trust God and we say, you're first, there's a blessing that flows with that commitment. If you haven't made that commitment, by the way, I want to encourage you to still make it 90 days. Our commitment is this. If you tithe for 90 days and you don't see more of God's blessing in your life after than before, we return it all back to you. But don't tithe to this church if it's not your church. Do it to your church. But then ask them if they give you that refund as well because I don't know if they will. <laughs> but here we do. We just believe that when you obey God's word, that there's a blessing that follows it. And the blessing is so much bigger than money, prosperity. It's not that. The blessing of God is the favor of God in life. It is the peace that transcends understanding. It is a joy and a fulfillment that comes even when you're at the bottom of the pit, when you're in the workplace or the school where nobody likes you, when you feel like a life is all against you. Jesus taught us that you can have the favor of God even during unfavorable circumstances. That's the blessing of God. 
Week number two last week, we talked about blessable vision, and Pastor Philip gave us a a beautiful call to respond and make our lives about the things that burn in the heart of God. So here as a church, we have several of these things that we're trying to accomplish together, including what we do with Foster the City, which is providing loving homes for every foster child in our county, and now in over 12 counties, I believe, is that right? 16, I don't know, many counties around all California now. But it has expanded way beyond us. And every time we say, God, your vision is now my vision, he says, I will bless you. But today, I want to talk to you about why character matters more than accomplishment. Because all these things we've talked about, like generosity and helping orphans and, you know, kids in foster care, all of this is not meant to be a checkbox. It is actually meaningless to God if it doesn't come from the proper heart. Because what God desires from us is not just our religious behavior. He wants our hearts. And our hearts speak of our character. It's who we are when nobody's looking. And he's way more interested in our character being developed than our competencies growing. He's way more interested in the fruitfulness of our lives that come from good character than the fruitfulness that comes out of just doing the right thing. You can do a lot of the right things with the wrong heart, but God looks at the heart, and Haggai calls people to reflect on this. It's a teachable moment in chapter 2. I want to journey with you there. So it's Haggai 2, verse 11. He says it this way. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. It's a little confusing, but stay with me. If someone carries consecrated meat, like holy meat, in a fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew or wine or olive oil or food, does it become consecrated? Like if you have something holy, and the holy touches the unholy, does it make the unholy holy? I don't know, he's making a point. And he goes on, and the priest says, no. And then he says in verse 13, if a person then, let's flip it, is defiled by contact with a dead body, like they're, they're made impure by, by touching a corpse, and they touch one of these other things, does that now become defiled? And they say, yeah, it becomes defiled. So in other words, he's he's saying purity, holiness, is not passed by touch or proximity, but, but the rest is, right? Defilement is. Let me illustrate it in a simple way for you. In a, another way of putting it is this. There's, there are things that you would consider to be pure, and there are things that consider unpure in life. And if you take now something that is holy or pure or somebody that is, has good character, for example, and, and you pour that pure into what's dirty, this is actually a question I want you to answer all campuses, okay? Does the dirty become pure? Whoa, I must have confused you. In Sunnyvale and Fremont, I hope you're get, getting this. Let me try it again, okay? If I take the pure... And I pour it into the impure. Does the impure become pure? No. No. Does this look pure to you? But if I take that which is filthy and corrupt and impure, and I pour it into the pure, does it make the pure impure now? Yes. Some of you are like, is this a trick question? (laughs) It's not a trick question. It is a law of nature. It is how God designed things to be. Another way of saying it is that vices catch faster than virtues. Pollution is caught or spreads easier than purity. This is why when you enter your room and you throw your stuff out into the floor, it becomes very messy. It becomes messy naturally with life. But does it ever become orderly naturally? No. You have to make time and space. I feel like I'm talking to my kids right now. (laughs) You got to pick up the shirt, right? Like things don't come into order naturally, only intentionally, but disorder happens naturally. We cause all kinds of chaos in life, and chaos comes into us very naturally. And if we want to live pure lives, it requires a decision of our will. If we want our characters to flourish, it won't happen naturally because corruption is caught like a virus is caught. But character is not caught in the same way. 
You can be close to somebody that is really strong, and you don't become strong like them. I've tried. It doesn't work. But if there's somebody that has got a filthy mouth and filthy character and, and there's stuff around you that is, is corrupt in culture, well, you don't have to do anything but just be around that for it to contaminate and influence you and I. It's just the way that it is. But your character is way more valuable than your accomplishment. And Haggai is trying to show them something, give them a teachable moment. So he takes them back and he says this, just like the pure is contaminated by the impure, he says, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, says the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer here is defiled. They've let people sin in and corruption. They've, they now have blind spots in their spirituality. And if you miss week one, what had happened to them is that God had set them free from the, cap the Babylonian captivity, and that he made the wood from the forest of Lebanon available for them to build the temple of God. And so they went up the hill, and they got the wood, and they came down the hill, and instead of building the temple of God, they took the plaques, and they began to build their own houses. And you might be wondering, how did that happen? Like, how did they steal from God? How, how, did, how was it? that 50,000 people began to all neglect the work of God and not even notice it. Their character got corrupted by culture without even knowing it. You know how I think it happened? I think somebody was bringing it down the hill, and they were like, ooh, this smells good. Mmm, beautiful wood. Wow, this looks good. And I know I'm supposed to use it to advance God's kingdom on the earth, and these resources God gave me is for his purposes, his provisions always for his purposes, but I, I have a wall in my house that this would look really good in. It's my dining room wall, and the bottom of it, I think if I put wood there, it would prevent the chairs from bumping against it. So the guy went out there and built a nice dining room with it, and then he had some guests over to the house. And the guests came, oh, that's really pretty wood you have on your wall. We all have walls made out of other stuff, but you have really beautiful wood. And he's like, yeah, I just took a little bit, a little bit. I just, I just kind of neglect, you know, I know God said to do this, but I just a little bit, but it looks so good. And like, yeah, it looks good. I have a wall in my house that it would look good. So they, he went out and he put this on his wall as well. And then before you know it, somebody else came over to that person's house and like, I want to build a table and that, that wood looks really good. Where'd you get it? And then more and more people, and then dozens and dozens, and before you know it, 50,000 people had taken the wood that God clearly said was intended to build, advance his kingdom on the earth, and it's all over their walls. And you know what about you is happening? They're having all these uh, Sabbath dinners in the Jewish community, and they're like, God, we thank you for your incredible provision that you've given to me. And they're talking about God while their walls, their surrounding, their homes are full of blind spots of disobedience. And they begin to wonder, why don't we sense God's blessing anymore? What happened? God, you said you would provide, you would bless but what, what is it? What, what happens? See, vices catch faster than virtues, and pollution spreads easier than purity, and your character is more valuable than your accomplishments. But what happens is we gain blind spots, even as people of faith. I know not of all of us here echo I have a relationship with Jesus yet, but those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus... Part of calling Jesus Lord is we say, God, everything that you say in your word is my pattern of life. Like, I will respond to every word that you've given to me. But then we get blind spots because we look around while like, nobody honors marriage. Why should I honor marriage? Why, why should I stay pure when nobody stays pure? And then you meet somebody else that called themselves a follower of Jesus, and they, they're having all kinds of sexual, you know, impurities, and like, well, they, they seem to be okay, so I'm going to do it. And then before you know it, nobody does this. Nobody honors God with their generosity. Why should I? Everybody's greedy here in the Bay Area. Everybody just focuses on their own career and ambition. Everybody is all about climbing the, the, the pathway to influence with our careers, and they don't think God is like number two, three, four, five, six for everybody, and maybe it's okay. Everybody complains. Everybody does it, and before we know it, we've lost the blessing of God, and Haggai would say, how's it working for you? 
So in verse 15, he says, Now give careful thought to this day. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. He wants them to remember what life was like when they were in disobedience. See, some of you, you've been following Jesus for a little while. Maybe you forgot even, forgot what it was like when you didn't know, when your life was fully misaligned and how there was an emptiness in your soul. And he's like, I want you to remember that. Remember what was happening to you before you started working on the temple? When anyone came to a heap of, uh, or to, to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. And he goes on to explain, you, didn't, you were not getting what you were hoping for. Then he says, but from this day forward, from, the 20, from this 24th day of the nine months, give careful thought. I love that he named the day. Like, mark this date in the calendar, people. I want to show you how your character is more valuable than your accomplishment. And when you align your character with my will, how there's a blessing. And I don't want you to forget. He says, is there any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. Like, you've, you've been empty inside. But from this day on, I will bless you. This phrase should give us so much hope. What he's saying is it doesn't matter how much junk is in your past. The moment that you and I return to God, the moment we say, Jesus, I want you to have my life, just like you witnessed today at some of our locations, we had baptisms and people saying, I'm I'm surrendering my life to God and I want a new life. Jesus comes and he says, I'll wash your sin as far as the east is from the west. I will give you a new beginning. He says, you know, you're reaping right now the harvest of yesterday, but the harvest of tomorrow is based on the seeds of today. And if you want a new harvest tomorrow, if you want fulfillment and peace and the favor of God, which is that grace extended to those that align their lives with his will, then you've got to expose your brokenness. You don't have to hide it. You just have to confess it because when you confess your sins to a God who is loving, he is faithful to forgive. He gives us new beginnings. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to be looking at that that paneled wall and just think, "Ah, I stole from God. All we need to do is say, God, I want you to be first. Your priorities are my priorities. My heart matters more than my accomplishments. And whatever it is that I've been hiding from you, I'm bringing it to the light because I believe you're a loving God and you can take my mess and give me a new beginning. So he says, mark the day. Today can be different than yesterday. You don't have to live in the sins of the past. You can cultivate a new harvest of tomorrow if you turn today your heart to God. See, before changing behavior, God just wants to change our heart. And he knows that once your heart is fully his, all the behaviors begin to change as a result of it. Then we will start using everything we have for something much bigger than ourselves. Our character matters more than our accomplishments. But instead of breaking it up and telling you some practical ways of what this looks like, I want you to see it in the lives of two of some of my favorite people here at Echo. I want to welcome to the stage Darren and Vivian. Come on over. Can we give it up for these two? As we set up here our seats, let me just tell you why I invited these two to the stage. Uh, Vivian, I've known her for over a decade now, and Darren, actually almost, almost, no, I don't know how long, several years now, uh, eight, eight or nine years, and these two are some of the most faithful people I, I know in life, and when it comes to character, uh, people often ask me, like, how do you know if you can trust somebody? Uh, there's a few questions I always ask. One is, will I trust them to take care of my kids? And at least Vivian, yes, I don't know about Darren. Uh, I'm just kidding, man. Uh, Yes, uh, fully trust them with every part of my life, but I've seen the fruit of their lives. I've seen them make tough decisions that are so countercultural for the sake of their relationship with God. And I actually want to start by asking you this question. I'm going to start with you, Vivian. What was it like for you before? Like, hey, guys, said, consider your ways. Remember what things were like 
before you put God first. And I know it's hard for you to remember those days, but give us a little glimpse of what, what was your ambition? What did you live for before you met Jesus? Yes. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, as an immigrant, uh, growing up in an immigrant family, so there is a lot of strife for the American dream. Uh, it is that if you get, you know, to this good college, then you can get a good job, then you can uh, go to this, um, you know, get the next promotion, just climbing the corporate ladder. So there was a lot of that, um, yeah, just striving for that dream. And um, But at the end of the day, you know, even after I accomplished a lot of these, um, these goals that I have in, in my career, and there was still that dissatisfaction and worry about the future is really like what the book of Haggai was saying, is that I was um, hungry um, and I was thirsty uh, for more, so... Mm. And how about you, Darren? Yeah, this is uh, my second time listening to this message now. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's really resonating in this go around is uh, who, who I was before Jesus, where my heart was at, and why I was striving for the things I was striving for. So I cared a lot about similar to Vivian, corporate ladder, making a boatload of money. That's really what I cared about. And the reason why I think this is just important to say is that there's something in my spirit that felt very insecure about my life. Either way, the way I grew up with my parents, uh, this a scarcity mindset, not feeling like I had enough, feeling that I needed to prove myself by moving up the ladder of some sort. Uh, so my identity was wrapped fully in money, like it was actually controlling my life. It actually was every single milestone I thought about my life was tied in to how much money I made. Hmm. So we know money is amoral. Like there, there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. There's people, great godly people with a lot of money and godly people with very little money. But one of the things I've seen in both of you guys is there's a, a transformation that's happened over the last decade of your life as you've put God first. And a lot of those decisions were countercultural. So in some cases, you chose to have jobs that pay you half of what you were pay, getting paid before. In some instances, like for you, Darren, it's taking a risk and quitting your job and going to start a new endeavor that's more about the kingdom than your own ambition. And these things are risky, but talk to us a little bit about the blessing side of it. Like what happened to your life as you've made these tough decisions to put God first, what was the result? Like, what, what was the, the product of that? Yeah, I just, again, even reflecting the question, I just wanted to come on, you know, the word honor. Um, even as I honor God with, you know, um, obeying the commands to return the tithe or partnering with organization to give, um, give to certain initiative or um, even just you know, small voice in saying that text your friend who needs some encouragement or being faithful with the little things that God has given, given me and my family. I just find that, um, that God also in return honor us. Um, even in the book of Haggai, it, it talked about, um, in the beginning of it, it says that God has taken pleasure as we honor him, as the Israelite honor him. And at the end of it, it says that, you know, um, God had given uh, the Israelite promise and then the one thing that was so mind-blowing blow and I would just keep even meditating is that it says that the Lord of heavenly armies says, um, I will honor you. And I just felt the same, really just felt like the Lord is just has been honoring me and my family through instilling a, a purpose and a love for this region, a love for this local church, and um, just a promise to be able to like live in this space that, you know, he is with us. And that is a blessing that I, it's really so hard to explain, but as we honor, God honors, and mm -hmm. um, we just feel so uh, privileged to be part of this. Wow, thanks for sharing that. Darren, what about you, man? What's the, the difference that it's made for you to put God first, and like, what, what was the result of some of that in your life? Yeah, you know, if you're new to faith or just exploring Jesus now, I, I remember pretty clearly I think the word that comes to mind is ignorance. I know it sounds kind of strong, but I was ignorant to what God could do in my life. It was a bit scary to want to jump into the deep end and, 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 and obey and listen. I didn't understand the kind of fruit that would materialize from it. And one scripture that pops into mind that gives me a lot of encouragement is Ephesians 3.20. And it says something along the lines that God, God will do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. And I don't know, man, I have a pretty vivid imagination. So... Whatever I think is possible, God will still, still do immeasurably more than that. So as you press into Jesus, you saw baptisms today where you guys are stepping into the 90-day challenge. 
there's this part that you can contend with and believe that he will be doing that. And uh, I feel that much of my life, when I think of my, myself and my wife, Grace, man, it's like he just shows up every single time. Mm. And his goodness is mighty and it's powerful and it just brings you to your knees. And there's no, there's like, there's no reason why I wouldn't keep desiring and wanting that. Mm. Let me double click on something you said, okay? So I know your story, a lot of people don't, but you were in the tech field, uh, climbing the career path pretty heavily, making a lot of money. In fact, I have this vivid memory of a time when you were like at the peak of your uh, money-making time, and we had this funny conversation that I think someone mentioned to you, hey, you're like the, the, second, uh, top, the top, second top giver of Echo, and, he, and you were like, how do I become the first? Uh, <laughs> and you, you wanted like, I'll give everybody, which is so rare in our day, but now you've taken a bold step that you, you basically let go of all the stuff you were doing, and you stepped into this new initiative of developing an app that serves the church and the kingdom of God, and you're, in a way, living paycheck to paycheck. It's a whole different reality for you of faith and boldness. Um, but to a lot of people, that, that makes no sense. Like, why would you do such a thing? And it's not everybody's calling, but for you, that was your obedience. How did you do the hard thing? Like, why, tell, tell, talk to us about that. I, I, just tying back into the last point, you know, when you press into God and you really start to develop your relationship with Jesus, he shows up. And that, what does it do? What does it, do? it builds your faith. It, it convinces you that, man, this God that I can't see, he's real. And he loves me. And I made it in his image. And he wants a personal relationship with me. So these are words. These are phrases you hear every week. But then all of a sudden it becomes reality. It's no longer just knowledge in your mind. And it's revelation. And, you know, kind of what you were sharing, it's a... Uh, uh, I was kind of getting emotional when you were saying that. I, I'm pretty competitive, so that's why I actually made the comment at that time. But um, it made me think very recently how, uh, I know this sounds kind of wild, but I really do hope that whatever I do in this next venture with my co-founders and such really, really financially blesses the church in ways that I don't even understand. I think of Luke 12, where... Um, it's writing is around, uh, it's about a rich fool who basically stores all his treasures in a barn. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to live. I don't want to come to the end of the road. And it's like, oh, cool. I guess we'll just use this money to play Monopoly in heaven. Like, I don't want to do that. I, I want to, I want, I want to see it now. I'm from the Bay. I'll, I'll be, I'll be quick. I know, I know I'm <laughs> I hear the music. I hear the music. I'm from the Bay. And I didn't come to faith till I was, until nine years ago. And Jesus has transformed my life so much that I, I, I cannot wait for those of you who have never stepped into giving financially. When you do it, man, you're like, you're really in for a treat. You really are. And uh, I don't know anyone who goes in and goes, oh man, wish I didn't give. Like that, no one t says that. They all come out and go, I am so glad I did that. And your heart changes and he lifts up a bigger vision for what, you, what he wants and you're in his kingdom. So, sorry, I can preach a message on that. I'll stop yeah, now. <laughs> thanks for saying that. Stay here with me. You know, I want to invite you to a moment of reflection and maybe even close your eyes at whatever campus you have just so it's between you and God. What Darren just said even, that there's blessing when you give. It's not really just money. It's your life. And Jesus calls us to give him all of our lives, every part, every room of this house, it's, it's our relationships, it's our ambition, our careers, our dreams, our accomplishments. And I wonder if there's something that he's revealing to you during our time that's like, this has been a blind spot for you. And now that I'm bringing it to the light, I want you to bring it in alignment to my will so that I can bless you. God's revealing that to you right now, right there in your heart. Just say it to him, God, it's yours. I'm willing to step in obedience to you. Surrender it to him. If you haven't invited Jesus to be the master, the Lord of your life, Scripture says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is God, Lord, that he conquered the grave on your behalf, that you're saved. The first thing you do 
to be saved, to have a relationship with Him is not good deeds. It's just belief. It's who you are that matters more than what you do is what He's saying. So take a moment to relinquish control right now and say, Jesus, you have my life. You have everything. It's yours. And Father, I want to ask you to bless every person that is here today. Bless us, God, with your favor, your grace. May every word that you've spoken to us be a word that we apply. Make us a church, a community that honors your name, Jesus, that reflects your character. And help us to value our character more than every accomplishment. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank these two as well for being a part? What a great moment for us to reflect on and see God working in the lives of individuals that are right here, a part of our church. It makes it more personal to all of us. And the last point that Pastor Felipe talked about was how the seeds of today are connect, or the harvest of tomorrow is connected to the seeds of today. And it makes me think that we all have some sort of seed that we need to plant. And that's why at the end of our time together, we always make space to do what we call checking in. Checking in is our way of solidifying that little seed, that little notion of what the Holy Spirit has put on our hearts and planting it and putting it into practice. And so I want to encourage you, if you don't have your digital program handy, to go ahead and grab it out right now. And you'll notice the top button there is the check-in button. As you click that and you indicate, maybe if it's your first time here and you fill out your information, you'll notice at the bottom there's a few different potential decisions for you. Maybe you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Felipe saying, Jesus, I want to give you everything. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to align who I am with you, and I want to be a follower of Jesus. Today, I'm planting that seed. Maybe for you, you saw somebody get into the water and you've recognized that that's a decision you've been needing to make. You've already decided to say, Jesus, you're my Lord and my Savior, but you haven't yet gone public and shared with the world that this is who I am now. We would love for you to indicate that and then let us walk alongside of you in creating that opportunity. But no matter where you are, no matter what your step is, we would love to know and come alongside and pray with you in that journey. And as we kind of get our hearts as a campus prepared for Easter, we know that there's going to be hundreds of individuals that are making their way here. And one of the things we want to do as a campus collectively is prepare the soil of our ground to be ready for what God wants to do that day. And so the Wednesday before Easter, we are opening the campus and creating a prayer environment. All the information is right there on your digital program, but from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., we're gonna have stations set up for us to go and reflect in the moments that Jesus experienced leading up to the cross and the resurrection. We're gonna have an opportunity to pray for our friends and family that don't yet know him and immerse ourselves in the posture of aligning our hearts. And then that evening at 7 p.m., we're gonna gather together for an acoustic prayer and worship night as a campus, really asking for him to move at Easter and in our wonderfully made series. And so we'd love for you to join us. Maybe that is your next step. For some of you, you've been hearing this message about the tithe challenge, or you've been on this journey of generosity and you know that there's a bold step of faith in front of you. And that's why each and every week we have a moment of generosity where we click that give button on the digital program and we plant that seed of generosity in our lives, trusting that God can do more with what's in his hands than I could do with what's in mine. And so we're so thankful for so many individuals that are consistent in their giving to the local church, believing in what God will do, but we know that there's more. There's more blessing for your life and there's more opportunity for what God wants to do in his church. And so if you have been feeling that stirring to join our 90 day tithe challenge, would you click that button on the digital program or scan this QR code and let us come alongside of you as you journey 
And then once you've let us know, go and click the give button and set up your recurring gift right there on our giving platform so you can watch God do what he wants to do in your life. As a reminder, this is never out of guilt or obligation. This is an opportunity for us to align our hearts with what is important to God. And we know that the generosity directly impacts the individuals that make their way here on Easter and so many other weekends. But we know that a lot of the individuals that do make their way here have a lot of interesting questions. And sometimes those questions can be right from within our own home. So as you get prepared to give, our marketing team has put together a scenario that maybe you or someone you know have experienced when asking questions about Easter. Go ahead and check out this short video. Easter because it's Easter you know we go to church we hunt for eggs and we take pictures with Easter Bunny does that mean the Easter Bunny lives in church at church we celebrate how Jesus came back to life was the bunny Jesus's pet mm, no the Easter Bunny is not Jesus's pet did he kill Jesus mm, no the Easter Bunny did not kill Jesus Jesus died and came back to life. Is he a zombie? No, he's not a zombie. God brought him back to life. Here, I got it. Chat GPT. Easter is celebrated with various traditions around the world, including church services, egg hunts, and Easter parades. <laughs> Eggs, bunnies, and chicks are common symbols of Easter, symbolizing new life and fertility. What fertility? We will not be addressing the topic of fertility on Easter Sunday this year, but we will be addressing the topic of Jesus and his sacrifice and his love. And so this is another great way to invite those friends and family to join us on Easter. Hey, as you make your way out, we want to continue to spread the word. And so we put out some yard signs for you to take home. Uh, the ones, for those of you that have a yard, uh, take the ones with the metal connected to it. But we understand we live in the Silicon Valley and not everybody has a yard. So if you live in an apartment or you drive a car, grab one without the metal signs and put it in the window. Uh, if you're going to do it in your car, just make sure it doesn't block your driving. Uh, but as a way to continue to showcase that love to everybody around us as an invitation. It's a double-sided one with Hunt on one side and Easter on the other. So. Feel free to use it and flip it as we go towards Hunt this next weekend. Have a great one, and we'll see you guys next week. Well, thanks for tuning in for our online services here at Echo. Thrilled that you're here. Hope you enjoyed the experience. Maybe God spoke something to your heart specifically. Maybe it's through Pastor Felipe or through the stories of Darren and Vivian. Please don't let go of those things. Make sure you do something with it this week. Because it's when we do something with the things that we learn that we see the change we desire happen in our lives. Well, that wraps up our time. Next week, again, is the last week of our Blessable series with Pastor Felipe has a final message for... Oh, no, sorry. It's going to be our campus pastor, Stephen Zier, who's going to be bringing the message for that one. So make sure you tune in for this. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of these other ones moving forward. And we'll have a great rest of your Sunday. And we'll see you next time. And we'll see you at Easter as well. Bye.